getting the waters tested the Marcellus Shale factor. And it's important to use it that way, and that's my perspective. The Marcellus Shale is not just something new that is all the big, a big problem we have. It's another factor that we have to deal with. We have tons of old issues that we've dealt with in the, that we have still going on in the past. We have poorly constructed private wells. And we have almost no background data in some cases. And we have new industry coming in and doing things. And it's just one part of the issue that we have going on. Again, this is me, Brian Orm, uh, my company. One of the, the one portal I maintain is called the Water Research Center. It's actually a free website. Uh, we pay and maintain where you can go and find information about everything I know about drinking water quality is there. My main goal to put that up was I hated talking to people on the phone. So right now, I do about 2,000 visitors a day that aren't asking me a question, and I love it. I get people from all over the world, other countries, come in there and ask questions, and maybe I get five or six emails about content or questions about what I might not have on the website. Great portal. These are what, this is what I do. My wife made me put this up, you know, because she's my uh, partner in my business, or our business, I should say. And the, this is the Water Research Center. Uh, just to let you know, I am in the game. I mean, I don't work for a gas company. I, I don't have any contracts with them, but I'm in the game in the sense that I, every effort that I can be involved in being on a tour or being involved in anything. Uh, the photo on the left is actually a photo of the recent sampling EPA is done. I had one of the residents in Dimmick actually invite me out. It was great. I got to talk to the uh, guys from EPA and DEP there and actually you know, be there during the sampling of those wells. Uh, this happens to be me, uh, not me there, sorry. I'm on the drilling pad taking that photo, watching a bit change. Uh, it's critical to be, to be involved. The current things I'm doing that I really wanted to point out, and that's the one, the one, f one page handout that I have here. It is the one program I am working with Wilkes. Uh, it is me, I'm providing all my time in kind. I started this when I worked at Wilkes University. It's called the Citizen Groundwater and Surface Water Database. This database will only take certified data that comes from citizens. So if a natural gas company did a baseline, if it was third party chain of custody, you can submit it. And the way the process works is you can submit the data. I will look at it for free, tell you if there's any issues, that you have action items. And then if you wish to have that data released to the database, the data only, not your name, address, phone number, or any information, you can do that. The other thing we have going is a private well owner watershed group survey. Basically, it's looking at for a couple different things. The one is with respect to Marcellus Shale, what, if any, issues you have of concern. But also in this survey are all the other issues that are concerned for our community, non-point source pollution, malfunctioning septic systems, et cetera. So I just want to point that out. And this is a one-page summary. It has websites so you can go to. Thank you. Uh, disclaimer, my goals. My talk, as I said, is me. My personal and professional opinion, when I kind of get off track and I'm giving you more of my personal opinion, I'll try to wave my hand to let you know that. But everything up here is based on my professional experience, my professional expertise, and published data, unless I wave my hand. But I am Polish, so you have to watch out because I wave my hand a lot. I don't know what that means, so let's not worry about it. I think that's their computer. I'm not being compensated for anything, so I'll let you know. And again, we're talking about science and facts. My main goal is get the waters tested. I've been saying that for 23 years. I've been doing workshops for private well owners. Just tell them, you know what? You're drinking well water and it has problems. Would you mind just you know, spending a couple bucks and getting a water test? I've been doing that for 23 years. And I'll say it. It took an industry to come into town to get some people interested. Need to educate the homeowner about wellhead protection, things that you can do to protect your own water. Because your water that comes in your well really comes from your property and the properties around you. Trying to get more people to add more data to the citizen database, the more I see, the more I know. And the more homeowners I help, which is my main goal. Support private well construction standards. I'm intimately involved in that, trying to review legislation. Also, fixing private wells. I'm the chairperson from a nonprofit organization. I'm happy to say it done last year, we fixed our first private well. We actually provided the family over $5,000 to fix their well water to provide drinking water, drinking water for that house and protect our groundwater resources. Uh, the one phrase I like to use is we all live downstream. Target audience is the stakeholders, which is community, advocacy groups or scientists, municipal officials, water suppliers. 
Our drinking water, it's the match of the century, right? Pick a side and see who wins. No, that's what's getting us all in this trouble. This is not the battle. You know, this is not a, a, an us against them, and it shouldn't be. You know, we all have skin in the game, and again, my, the phrase I got from a, a really, really old workshop is we all live downstream. We all want to have clean water for us and the people down gradient, and we're all doing our best to do that. Okay, and you know, we, we always forget this is a photo, and that red spot, that's home heating oil. That's one of my clients I caught called on a Sunday, or Monday, and it's Brian, I have no home heating oil. It's gone. Where'd it go? I lost 400 gallons. I just had to fill Saturday. Where'd it go? Well, the stream outside, right outside his house, there's a ditch. It went in the ditch, and as soon as I was driving up to his house for a half mile down gradient, I can smell that home heating oil. All right, so it's not just you know, natural gas. It's also everything we do and use. This is geology where we're at. Again, try to go through pretty quick. Susquehanna County, it's called the Appalachian Plateau. So when you hear the word plateau, we're thinking about rocks. It's called Hamburg geology. You have a bun, you have a lettuce, tomato, another bun, maybe Hamburg, you know, if we're lucky, and another bun on the bottom. Hamburg geology, layer cake geology. Up in this area, sometimes the rock could be tilted towards the west, and you see you have this little tilt. In general, rocks go from younger rocks to older rocks. Right? Marcellus Shale is older than the water we get, so that's all the way down here. Our drinking water supply comes all the way up here, over 4,000 feet of separation. This is the drinking water in PA. Well, if you notice, that's not 100%. Well, this is really drinking water PA. About 50% of private wells in PA have water that meets the drinking water standards. About 50% don't. Now, I don't know when I moved to a third world country, but how much time do you hear about this in the press? We have a lot of press that talks about wells being impacted, we got to fix them. Okay, great. But wait a second, I got 50% of private well owners in PA that have water quality that doesn't meet the drinking water standards, and nobody's doing anything about it? At all? Come on. Private wells aren't regulated by anybody, EPA, DEP, no one, counties, there's a few of them, some townships, and we don't even know where these wells are. Again, this is an excellent opportunity for what's being done in Pennsylvania with the Marcellus Shale. We have natural gas companies coming in, taking water samples prior to drilling, documenting what the water quality is like. And you know what? 30% to 50% of the homeowners are getting their stuff back and say, what do you mean I can't drink my water? What do you mean it's got bacteria in it? What do you mean there's arsenic in it? What do you mean, huh? And they say, oh, good luck. We kind of lost the ball there. The common water quality problems in Pennsylvania would be corrosive water. That would make the water, if you fill your tub up and it has a green patina, or ever has a metallic taste, that's corrosive water. Another common problem, the big one, is bacteria. And to a lesser extent, methane. I mean, I've seen it typically under seven. Uh, actually, I've seen it way higher. Like we said, I lit my first well in 89. Radon gas. Barium tends to be less than one milligram per liter, but I've seen it higher. Yeah, we see we got one here, so please release the data to me. We get it in the database. No name and address or phone number. Right? That, I, this will not make a good movie to show. Very animated. I have fun. Bromide. Bromide. What is bromide? Bromide in groundwater. Less than uh, 0.07 milligrams per liter. Or if you work for the press, we put down 70. Because it looks better. <laughs> right? Sodium tends to be less than 15 milligrams per liter. By the way, there is no drinking water standard for sodium, no matter what you read. Uh, there's only been a proposed uh, limit that's been, been putting, trying to put sodium on the candidate list. I will tell you, if they ever make sodium, uh, put it on the candidate list at 20 milligrams per liter, most private water supplies will not be drinkable. That will never happen. What causes most of our problems? These are the things, when I've taken a well cap off a well, I have seen. Oh, wait a second. I, me, personally, I took a well cap off a well, and this is what I've seen underneath. The thing that freaked me out the most was the snakes. No, it doesn't say snake. It says snakes. That was up here in Susquehanna County. Three of them. Three. I hate snakes. Can't stand snakes. 
But what this tells me is that not only do we have to worry about private wells being impacted, but private wells are actually the potential facilitator. A poorly constructed, constructed private well can facilitate contamination of other private wells that are properly constructed. We have problems in PA. What are the problems? Poorly constructed wells. Wells too deep. We actually have wells that actually mix the fresh water and saline water. Yes, we do have saline water. You can go up to salt springs and see them bubbling out. And by the way, you can actually light it. The gas coming out. We have that. That's natural. And we have wells in the wrong place. Okay? So again, when we talk about how old water is, a properly, see we have the, sorry, fresh water, then the saline water down here in the bottom, then with some brine water really concentrated, and finally get to the point where there's really no circulation, where the water doesn't move. It's been in the formation ever since that was deposited. So the Marcellus Shale is how many years old? 400 million years old. How long has the water been in that shale? 400 million years. Has it moved a lick? No. So properly constructed well seals off the unconsolidated material and, and protects the confined aquifer. Poorly constructed wells cause interconnection. These are wells, for example, if you go test that well, it has a bacteria problem. When it rains, it gets dirty. It might have high chlorides. Wells that are too deep. I'll show you an example of an actual example from Lake Cary area. A well too deep and how that's affecting water quality. So we talked about how contaminants move in. So if we have a poorly constructed water, water well, water can actually move right along the casing of poorly constructed wells and impact this really well constructed well. If we have water contaminants moving through the formation itself, again, the contaminants can hit this casing, come down, and actually go right into the aquifer, short-circuiting it. Now, this, this same properly constructed well could have the contaminants move, not go in, but it's actually these other wells upgrading it that are impacting that well. Now, if you don't believe me, that's fine. I have tons of work I've done in Monroe County that have, have shown that. And for example, in Monroe County, uh, Pennsylvania, I had actually one private well affect over 30 private well, other private wells with bacteria because of this simple problem. That was 30 home disinfection systems that had to be put on. We have wells in the wrong place. That's a quarry just uh, to your west of Dimmick. That's one of the pro I do quarry permits. That's one of my jobs. I have wells within 100 feet of the high wall. Believe it or not, I have a well 25 foot from this. This is the cows walking around in their own manure. Really? Front photo. You know, this guy is actually a trash guy. And then we have this flowing artesian well next to a stream. And believe it or not, that's 200 feet apart. Huh? They actually let people get water out of this at your own risk? What do we know? Back in about 1996, USGS did a study, and they said 70%, 70, not 7, 70% of private wells have and produce water that produces acute and chronic health concerns. Huh? I don't live in Bangladesh. A study done in two, 19, that was published in 2002, evaluated data from 1999 to 2000, and found that 64% of waterborne disease outbreaks could be attributed to unregulated private wells. Not six. My work when I was at Wilkes, depending on you know, how the data was coming in, anywhere from 30% to 50% of private, well owner, private wells produced water that did not meet an acute drinking water standard. And typically that's cold, total coliform bacteria and E. coli. But it also could include arsenic, lead, and many other things. And my data is backed up by Penn State. Penn State's average over the years of doing it with the Master Well Owner Program is somewhere between 33 and 50 percent. So my data makes sense. You know, private well protection is not just the Marcellus Shale issue. And I'll be honest with you, it's also an issue of other private wells. But it's also an issue of all these other things. Let's not forget, Marcellus Shale is not 
the sole problem, it's one issue we have to worry about, but maybe a significant issue is all those poorly constructed private wells we should fix. Some photos of private wells, hmm, that's the top of the well there. The water level in that pond is about here, hmm. If you notice the top of the well right here, this is the uh, pressure gauge. This actually submerged. Water is actually going down in the casing. What's the Marcella shale factor? What the Marcella shale factor is is this. For 20 years I've been telling people to get their water tested, there's issues. Finally an industry comes in and tests the water for you and said, by the way, by the way, somebody's been telling you to do it, you have issues. We haven't dealt with it. These are all new. People looked at the water and said, the water's clear, it doesn't smell funny, and I wash my clothes and it tastes great. I have no problems. Wrong. The citizen database. What's in it? The goals of the database. I take as a central location. I will take pre-drilling and post-drilling data as long as it's documented. It has to be go through chain of custody, third-party samplers, and certified data. I have to see all that before it goes into that database. We, will, we do an approximate location for the well based on information you provide and we do a regional analysis. It's a great way for us to track actual groundwater quality and look at temporal or spatial changes. That's the goal. This is what it's showing so far. This is an excerpt of, from the database of all wells prior to drilling. So I don't have any of that issue. There's no post drilling data in this graph at all. I've removed all data from Susquehanna County, but in the Casco Formation. So these are all wells in, from the Casco Formation. 50% total coliform bacteria. Lead, 24%. Now these all exceed the drinking water standards. Manganese, about 12%. Iron, about 8%, all exceed the drinking water standard. Iron and manganese is regulated as a secondary drinking water standard for aesthetic reasons, not health reasons. Lead and total coliform are regulated for health reasons. Arsenic, about 6%, regulated for health reasons. The thing that floored me was plasticizers, phthalates. I was shocked when I saw phthalates at 8%, above 8% of the wells were above the drinking water standard. Where are these coming from? And, the, and I'll, I'll show you a slide where I think they're coming from. And then the rest are wells that are influenced by natural, by saline water. And it's about 1 to 3%, where you can get high sodium, chloride, gross alpha. It's typically associated with naturally occurring elevated levels of methane. Again, we go back to this photo. Our biggest problem was what? Bacteria. Who caused it? Us. We're the ones that put the wells in. We built them wrong. We put them in the wrong spot. Is it the homeowner's fault? Absolutely not. The state of Pennsylvania's? Absolutely. Corrosive water can leach the metals out of the pipe. And again, typically about 40% have low pH. And with that, you can see copper, lead, zinc, aluminum. If the water ever looks gray, it's aluminum. When you have saline water, you have very high pH. Corrosive water is, again, just what happens, pit corrosion. Iron manganese uh, water hardness, about, again, iron, about 8% of the wells from the database are above the drinking water standard, and for manganese, about 11. And what I thought was really neat, after I read some of the things that EPA proposed, I went back and looked at the published data. And this is a published data from 1937. And in 1937, they have Susquehanna County a well in the Chemunk Formation, which is a portion of the lower portion of the Catskill, at a depth of 300 feet, produced not only gas, but saline water. Hmm. 1930. I think that predates a lot of stuff. The other one I thought was fascinating was wells in the Catskill Formation, and this was published in 1984 by PA, State of Pennsylvania. 33% of the wells had high manganese in the Catskill Formation, above the drinking water standard. 25% had high lead, um, iron, 12% had high chloride, above the drinking water standard. If you go to the lower portion of the Catskill, closer to the Chemunk, 
We're up to 60% have high manganese. 50%. So I think my numbers, if not, or at least conservatively low, it could be higher. The more data I get, the better. One of the things I like to point out is if you have an iron and manganese problem, and sometimes you have an odor, that the problem could be caused by a bacteria. It's an iron-related bacteria. In general, if you have this nuisance bacteria, you will see odors, iron, manganese, sulfur, about 50% of the time. To be honest, uh, at my presentations, when I have to talk to gas companies, I suggest they also screen wells for this. This is a thing that will show intermittent problems where the iron and manganese levels will fluctuate significantly. The phthalates, the source of the phthalates, we have again that uh, number that exceeded the standard. And where I thought that came from is most of the wells have black coil pipe. It's a soft plastic pipe that makes it easy to get the pump down the well. Well, guess what? It's a soft plastic. Why is it soft? It's loaded with plasticizers and vinyl chloride. We don't have private wells, private wells actually constructed using NS certified materials. We need to. Arsenic. About 6% of the wells naturally or exceed the arsenic level. If you have high iron, you tend to have high, you can't have high hard arsenic. I was kind of shocked at the number uh, that they, they, they set up here that gave them concern. I have a well that's just south of here in Springville that's over almost 40 uh, part per billion arsenic. There's no drilling there. Again, it's only about 8%. It's a common problem. I added a few more. Sodium is not regulated by the EPA. Not regulated by DEP, there is no standard, period. They have it on the contaminant list for consideration. Typically when people have high sodiums, most of the time it's road salt issues. Typically we tell the homeowner, uh, the, the water treatment professional will tell them to put a reverse osmosis in. We usually tell them to go talk to your doctor and maybe they can just change your diet because maybe they just need to get rid of one piece of bread. You know, that's it. Because sodium only, the sodium from water accounts for only 1 to 2 percent of your dietary intake. Most of our sodium comes from our food, not what we drink. Background level from the database. Background, pre-drilling, nothing to do with Marcellus. Mean 15, look at the high end. 630. Where did that come from? Well, it, it looks like saline water from a well that was too deep. Okay? And again, so most of the, the high sodium looks like could be road salt issues, but definitely saline water intrusion from wells being too deep. Bromide, another look at bromide. Bromide, again, is not regulated. If you are putting a water treatment system in that includes ozone, you should check the bromide level because the ozonator will convert that to something else. It's an issue. But again, mean level, 0 0.07 milligrams per liter. Or if I'm writing for the, re the press again, that would be 70. So which sounds worse, 0 0.07 or 70? I got 70, uh, right? Again, what's the high level? Sorry, I'm trying to learn how to use this. 6.2, again, a well influenced by saline water. Saline water, it's a wonderful indicator for bromide, very high levels. Glycols, where do we get, what is the one place we get glycols from? Well, we have this wonderful new movement to use alternative energy. And I'm a big advocate. I funded and, and paid to host two energy expos in Luzerne County, where I sponsored those events. Okay, and that means actually handing over money, getting nothing for that, so people come and learn about it. One of the things that we do with, with that is we put these grounds, these wells in, these, these contacts in, and we recirculate ethylene glycol and propylene glycol through those wells. There's no construction standards for those wells. There's no permanent casing left in. And this is ethylene glycol or propylene glycol that's in the freshwater aquifer. And all that's around it is a little bit of sand with clay. Huh? That doesn't sound like a good idea. There actually is no drinking water standard for ethylene glycol. There is a guidance level for that. Other sources for ethylene glycol would be your uh, window washer fluid. Because of the ice, that's another great win. Your antifreeze or any coolants. I talked a little bit about this, how private wells can affect other wells. So these are two homes, home here, home here, sitting on a lake. The, by the way, this is actual data. This one well here, that well right here, is deeper than this well. And what's actually happening is water is coming up. 
The lake is a discharge zone. So you have to think about how the water moves. The water is moving towards the lake, but because the well is deeper, water is moving up. Well, let's look at well A. Well A is this well here. It's got methane at 10 to 15 milligrams per liter. There is no drilling anywhere near this well. This is down by Lake Cary. Bromide, 4 milligrams per liter. Or, if I was writing for a reporter, 4,000. Radon, 570 picocuries. Radon standard is a little fuzzy. There isn't really a standard. There's guidance. The lower level for the guidance is 300. Chloride, well over 250 milligrams per liter. Bromide, 1.5. Strontium, almost 6. And iron, 3.2. This is saline water mixing in with the fresh water. Well B, the well right next to it right here, just shallower. And again, the depth is only different, a 100 foot difference. Methane, 6 milligrams per liter. Chloride, 30. Barium, 1.13. Significantly lower. All right? So not only is it the private wells can influence the re local groundwater quality, but we have wells that are too deep in certain places. Methane gas migration. Oh, let me. So I'm going to my mic. Let me back up. Ways it can move. We have shallow gas. So that, as I mentioned from here, 300 foot down, we have shallow gas pockets. Producing gas, you can drive up to the salt seep. How many people have gone up to the salt seep? Cool place, isn't it? Very nice. Go up there, take a look at it. You can actually light it up. I have a video if you like YouTube. Go to YouTube and actually see my students lighting the spring on fire. I'm waiting for them to yell at me for that. Uh, natural migration, because it does naturally migrate. Even, even the, the gas out of the Casco naturally migrates, the, the gas out of the Marcellus naturally migrates, because it's an unconventional gas play. We're going to the reservoir rock to get this gas out. Normally we would get the gas by letting it leak out to the rock above it and get it that way. That's conventional gas. So that naturally happens, but it happens very slow over long periods of time. Facilitated movement because of private wells where they act as conduits and induced migration. Uh, it basically, uh, there's a lot of words here and this will be on the website, but it's a hidden problem in PA because why? It's colorless, odorless, and you might only notice if it's really, really high. Otherwise, you might not know you have it at all. Typically, the background levels can exceed, at least from my experience, over 20 milligrams per liter. It's highly variable. And it's highly variable even in the same well. You could have a well that one day is relatively low, come back, it's higher. Now, you remember the sample I put up um, with 10 to 15 milligrams per liter methane? Well, the reason why it's 10 to 15 milligrams per liter is this. I came out and tested it, it was 15 milligrams per liter. Chesapeake came out a week later to do their baseline, and the homeowner released the data to the database, and I got to see it. It was 10 in one week. Now, you, you see a lot more fluctuations than that. So just a quick source of some of our naturally occurring methane, wetlands, landfills, old landfills, lakes and lake sediments, the shallow gas, all can contribute to this. A uh, little bit more on methane gas. The old guidance was that for methane for a private well, we really shouldn't worry about it too much until it gets to 10 to 28 milligrams per liter. And really, the actual limit was at 28, where it's fully saturated at the surface. Back in about 2009, after looking at some data from Colorado, I recommended some revisions. I'm having, a, actually I have a website out that I just published where we talk about methane gas concentration and mitigation and create new action levels. I'm, I'm happy to say that finally the state has come along to my way of thinking and put seven as a new action level from 28. Uh, again, one of the things I'd like to point out is where is this methane gas coming from the Catskill Formation? Keep in mind, I did that project over in uh, the quarry for Rourke, just west of Dimmick. Uh, you could go there and actually see pieces of uh, interbedded coal and organic material and iron and manganese in the Catskill. You know, again, these, these are the, bi the raw materials we need to create shallow methane gas. So you can actually see that right here in the photo that way. By the way, the presentation, a PDF version, will be available and it will be single slides, color, that you can download so you have all this. Another methane gas, this was really neat I came across. Now this well, these are wells over in Luzerne County. Luzerne County, so far, every attempt to do Marcellus Shale gas extraction has been nothing. 
no commercial gas. But look it, I had one client I went to, he has two wells on his property. This is how close these wells are. Here, 500 feet deep. Here, 300 feet deep. Look at the difference in methane concentration. 500 foot well, 7 milligrams per liter. 300 foot, 1. So not only do we have temporal variation, not only do we have geospatial evaluation, changes from moving from here to another well across the valley, we have vertical. That all plays into this. So again, just to bring this to your attention, you can see what's kind of going on. Now it depends what you want to do with methane. If you want to try to get the highest level of methane in your well, these are the times that you can go out and sample. Again, if you want to bias your data. <laughs> Again, I always teach, I always teach what I taught at Wilkes, I always taught my students how to bias data. For one main reason, so you know when it's occurring. So when you're in a room and somebody's yelling out numbers like, oh, the level 7,000, you can go, wait a second, that's part per billion. We don't normally report that as part per billion. We usually report that as milligrams per liter. And that the value is seven. So again, if you want to bias your data, so homeowner's trying to set a baseline as, hey, my worst case on methane, the guy said, when the barometric pressure is low and the soils are completely saturated or frozen, that's a good time to sample. Because the gas can't get out of the soil, so where does it go out? The hole we've created in the ground. Gas is frozen, long-term pumping. You've pumped the well for a while. So when you pump the well for a very long time, what happens? Is that pressure of the water column is actually holding the methane down? And if you lower it really far, it comes out. All right, this is just some photos of, you know, up here. Now the one question I have is why is that, you know, I understand the outgassing because the methane level is high, but why is it brown? And so I did, I did, a, I did a, some bar testing, you know, and uh, you know, these are BART tests that are positive. So I'm thinking that some of that brown might be the presence of this iron bacteria in the water that's contributing to it. I'm not saying, again, if there's anybody in the room that has methane issues, I'm not saying there wasn't methane in the water, but you know, that, that bug that sometimes you see, or that jug, maybe that's contributing factor. I, I, again, I'm not saying, I'm not, I haven't been to people, all everybody's house, and I'm not saying they don't have problems, or, I don't, I don't what, no eggs, please. But I'm saying is that we do have some naturally occurring issues that plays into it, which is one of the reasons I suggest gas companies start doing this test. This is not a certified test. It's a screening test that costs you nine bucks a sample. Not very expensive. That's it. Uh, this was a recent sampling I did. I got called out where somebody said their water turned purple. So we went out and actually sampled the well. And uh, the, the well, right from the well, no problem. We went to another section of line, looked at that, and yep, that's, the, that's what we pulled out. Uh, took a sample of it and did a test on it. Uh, by the way, I paid for all this. This is all my data. I gave it to the homeowner for free. Iron bacteria, greater than 140,000 colonies per mil. Nuisance bacteria. Aluminum, 0.5 milligrams per liter. Iron, 1.87. Manganese, 5 milligrams per liter. Iron is above the drink of water limit. Manganese is above the drink of water limit. Aluminum is above the drink of water limit. Lead is above at the drink, just below the drink of water limit. No methane. Iron bacteria causes corrosion. Actually facilitates the leaching of metals out of piping. It's called MIC, M-I-C, microbiologically induced corrosion. We have that as a problem. I looked at the data from the Penn State study. I went to Penn State for my master's degree, and I was there right around the time Brian Swickstock was there. And I saw his data as it came out. I was kind of like flabbergasted that you could have a, a, a bromide spike happen in that short a time frame. And I asked him, what the heck's going on? What's not in your data? And so this is what I just created. This is just a drawing of somebody drilling a well. So when we drill well, what we do is we we have, and I'm not the greatest artist, and I don't have the ability to make drawings that are really interactive, but I tried here. So when we drill, we send down typically air and water through the center of the pipe, and that air and water comes up on the outside of the pipe. So we have this 
cycle that's formed. When that occurs, in places where we don't have casing, we pull material in from here, and if there's leaks, it'll pop out. So what I did was just kind of showing that accounting. So we have things here and things popping out here below the casing. So we get some mud and things like that move. You know, they're drilling. I tried. I don't know. I'm not the greatest artist. You know, hey, there's another little spike moving through. Now the properly constructed well got no problems, right? Because the casing is sitting down in the confined aquifer. And again, I talked to Brian about this, and he said the well that was 300 feet deep wasn't impacted, but the shallow one was. Okay, so as we're going, we're doing things, and finally this is a shallow well that's poorly constructed that's acting as that conduit for contamination. Maybe we have a line pit for mud, you know, and maybe that pit's got a crack in it. But again, the well that's not going to have, is going to have a problem is that poorly constructed private well. I will guarantee you, pre-drilling, that well had a bacteria problem, that well had a turbidity problem, that well had issues. My main point here is that data about a well having issues is important. That's the well that's vulnerable to contamination, vulnerable to impact, that maybe we need to think about what we're going to do about it. We're going to replace it. We're going to move things a little bit out of the way. When we're doing things, we're going to monitor that well. What are we going to do? If it happens to be a royalty owner well, when I go to royalty owners, I say, get rid of it. You have some money, replace it. Get it out of there. The key points here are, if we, if we relate this to Marcella Shale, proper casing of cement is critical. N the change in the oil and gas law has went a long way to help that. Knowing how the well is constructed. How many people in this room know how deep their well is? Thank you very much. I, I'd say less than half, because we all did this. Right? How many people know how much casing they have? OK? We don't know a whole lot. I have people that don't even know where the well is because they never had to change a pump. And then several other things that are being done by people is going to closed loop drilling to get rid of these things. Excellent move. Not required by legislation, but great practice. Big change in the oil gas law that made a difference is adding that second casing. Uh, this was a photo I took at a tour when I did at Chesapeake. So I, th I think that's Brian Grove in the back. I'm not sure. But we do have, that is an issue, and that's a long-standing issue with well construction is gas migration along the cement. I mean, it's, not, it's, not a, it's nothing that's hidden, but there are ways to fix that once it's been identified. All right, so the big change is drilling, getting that extra casing down. The final thing I have heartburn over right now with the oil and gas regs where I always argue with is that depending how you read the legislation or the regs, there is a zone where we may not have to cement. Some gas companies do that, some don't. Uh, again, my professional opinion is that we should cement all the way back up in inside the inner steel casing. Again, some companies do that. I don't know the practices up here, to be honest, but you could take that up with your, your con your, uh, your, uh, the local contractor. The reason why I like it is because if gas leaks out, it can leak out in that area. And more importantly, we have issues with deep wells. So not only the gas leak out, it can only accumulate, in this case, we back and accumulate, have that deep well could be that conduit. So I'm a big advocate for cementing all the way back in the steel. If, you're gonna, if there's going to be a, a leak in the casing or the cement, let's have it at the wellhead where we can manage it. That's basically what I'm you know, looking at. Finally, and this is this another photo of it, where I'm talking about is this cement grouting here. Again, some companies doing it. That simple change actually makes oil and gas law and PA consistent with the requirements of the EPA UIC program. Because now by this single change, we're not only protecting fresh water, but we're protecting that potential fresh water, which is a requirement under UIC. UIC, Underground Injection Control Program, not regulated for hydrofracking for methane gas, but that would be an excellent change. I put this up for a change in the regulation. The one I love is Frac Focus. I went to a presentation down in Williamsport. Great tool for communities. Uh, I, I, the, my only recommendation is given the equation to convert the data to concentration. Uh, but a, a lot of these things are, are being done. So I just put that up there again. 
local issues. Again, you'll have this publication oh, uh, up there. The only thing I want to uh, point out, I'm sorry, I'm used to this mouse, I do apologize, is this. One of the things, I'd, if, if, if it comes up, is that we make an attempt to actually not, the Pennsylvania has a historic way of fixing methane issues in wells. That's called treatment. That's not what you have to do. There are actually other ways to actually modify the well itself to seal off the methane so it doesn't get in. We're not doing that in Pennsylvania. The new uh, PDF file I'm coming out with has those mitigation practices in it. Again, my big issue. Remember I said somewhere around 50% of private well owners have water they can't drink? That's 1.5 million people. Okay? And these aren't people that have chloride detected in their water or at 50 milligrams. These are people that drink water that doesn't meet a drink, acute drinking water standard. 1.5 million citizens. We need to fix this now. This is not a Marcellus Shale issue. It has nothing to do with this. It's a health issue. And if, you're, if you think about things in money, which I tend to do, it's an efficiency issue. If we have workers and people that are sick, it's a burden on our healthcare system. It, it, it's a burden on our workforce. It's a burden on our community. We don't need it. So again, not a Marcellus Shale issue, a health issue. If you want, you did all get three hours of professional development from me. <laughs> yeah? Thank you very much.